The following is a Big Sioux Media production. Welcome to this edition of People of Big Sioux Media podcast. This is Lee Palmer. Today we are joined by Call to Freedom Executive Director Becky Rasmussen. As we get ready for the rally, we want to talk about what Call, for, Call to Freedom does. We're going to talk a little bit about human trafficking and what's going on there, and then talk about signs to look for. So first of all, Becky, welcome. Thank you for having us, Lee. We appreciate the opportunity. So let's talk about what Call to Freedom is, how it started, how you got involved, and, and where we're going from here. Yeah, um, Call to Freedom is a nonprofit organization that offers supportive services to those that have been victimized by human trafficking or sexual exploitation. And we started uh, a little over four years ago, um, became a nonprofit in January of 2016 and opened our doors with a limited number of staff and started cl serving clients about two months after that. And we haven't stopped since. We are actually at 18 staff now that serve the, the state of South Dakota. And our services really um, are diversified um, just based on the needs of those that we serve. We do have a housing project, which is called Marissa's Housing Project, that actually houses uh, seven individuals that are coming out of trafficking, sex, uh, sex trafficking or labor trafficking situations. Um, and we basically navigate life with them, um, help them get jobs, occupational um, set them up with a routine in their life with counselors, mental health, um, large portion of those that we serve struggle with addiction as well. And so we really um, come alongside them in their journey and offer them any services that they need. Um, we do a lot of education, equipping of communities as well to better identify victims of human trafficking, but also to provide um, those services and responses within their own communities. So um, there's rural advocates within communities that we help come alongside and support them when they uh, identify a victim of human trafficking. We do awareness presentations we do prevention, um, we do trauma-informed trainings and first responders. So we're kind of a comprehensive services. Um, we want to make sure, number one, that more victims are identified and when they are, that they have safe places to go to be able to get out of those situations. And so um, I have a great staff. If anybody ever needs a training yeah. or is a first responder, we would love to be able to come out and connect with your organization and empower you to be a part of the, the answer in the community to combat human trafficking. So let's go back a little bit here with human trafficking, because when most people think human trafficking, they're thinking the sexual side of it. But as we've talked in the past, one of the larger components is the labor trafficking that goes on across the country as well. Yeah, I think labor, um, I think most anti-human trafficking groups would agree that labor trafficking is the least talked about and least recognized within communities, which makes it probably one of the most vulnerable um, uh, abilities to facilitate that kind of business. And so uh, labor trafficking is a use of force, fraud, or coercion to exploit somebody for uh, labor. And usually the, the defining between exploitation and uh, trafficking is if that person does not have the freedom to come or go within that work environment. So we work um, with foreign national populations, a um, lot of vulnerabilities with immigration policies, with bringing them over on temporary visas, getting them um, positions or better jobs, um, which usually do not end up being the scenario that they are um, pulled into. And when they get over here, um, they're usually kept in um, circumstances that they feel like they can't get out of and, and are trafficked. And then we also have for massage businesses um, that uh, trafficking is happening. And that's really hard to catch until you do um, sting operations. Um, and if they get on the radar, they usually move them from state to state so they don't stay local for too long. They will actually move um, those businesses, if they feel like they're on the radar to another state and just open another parlor and be facilitating. You saw the arrest a couple weeks ago, and that's what that individual was doing. He was actually putting out signs and offering massage opportunities, and people were answering those ads, and he was selling women. And so um, sometimes I would just say as a community, understand what human trafficking looks like, get educated, um, be equipped to better identify that, and then to also um, have the ability to know how to report that as well. 
one of the things that we've talked about because you hear it all the time well it's south dakota you're not we're small town everybody knows everybody but really south dakota because of the rural community and the small towns is a really good opportunity for human traffickers yeah for sure so rural communities um when when it's out of sight out of mind that's what traffickers like when you don't know how to identify it um, you're not educated within your quiz and a lot of rural communities are not equipped to address human trafficking because it takes a lot of resources as far as law enforcement um, and community members to, to, to say something and so um, and then also rural communities a lot of times when we have 29 and 90 229 and 90 going through our rural communities you have what we call the transit trafficking where it's going through different communities um, into you know Minnesota or or it's going to North Dakota, or it's going to Omaha. So they're coming through those rural communities. Maybe they're not staying, but they're, they're that transient um, way of trafficking. Um, they're coming through those communities, and and they'll use ERs, medical communities, and rural communities because they're not trained to be able to identify um, trafficking. And so, um, and then we also have three of the poorest counties located in the United States here in South Dakota with our reservations and a lot of vulnerabilities within our reservations. And so I'm really glad to see the work that's being done um, on the part of our Attorney General Jason Roundsburg to go after, after missing uh, individuals because when, when individuals go missing, it could be an exploitation situation or it could be a trafficking situation. But a lot of times traffickers will look for vulnerabilities. They'll look for vulnerabilities, not only in individuals, but they'll also look for vulnerabilities within communities and vulnerabilities within legislation. Um, and then they, they infiltrate based on those vulnerabilities. And so it's important for us to understand that it's happening and to make sure that we're equipped as a state to be able to say that this isn't welcome in South Dakota. One of the things when you think of it, when you think of trafficking, you think of movies like Taken and, and things like that. But, you know, you just had a poster the other day of a mother who was trafficking her own daughter after her daughter had been hooked on opioids by her brother. So yeah. it's not just some stranger walking in and doing this, is it? No, no. You know, um, familial trafficking is what you're referring to. And they actually, the trafficker, the, the, the victim knows the, the perpetrator and usually has a pretty intimate relationship with them. Um, one of the probably most common that we see walking through the doors of college freedom is parents trafficking their own children. Um, you know, they'll groom them at a very young age and then begin selling them um, at ages that, you know, no kid should know anything about the things that there has mm -hmm. to do. And so that's probably one of the hardest to identify because um, familial trafficking is somebody that they trust, is grooming them and introducing them to the lifestyle. So a lot of times when um, individuals are introduced that are in familial trafficking, they don't even know that they're being trafficked because their mother, their father, their aunt, their uncle, uncle rather, have introduced into this lifestyle. And they just think that that's normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of times, you know, as adults, what we're finding is as we equip first responders to ask the questions in vulnerable situations, um, these victims are answering yes to the questions of, of sex or, or labor trafficking. And then that first responder, be it a domestic violence shelter, medical community is saying, have you ever heard of Call to Freedom? Have you ever heard of human trafficking? And that's the first time that that they realized that their victimization was just that. It was it was a form of trafficking. It wasn't something that they should ever have been introduced to or been forced to do. Um, but unfortunately, the person they trusted the most is the person who introduced them to this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that's really difficult. That's really hard. Um, and it's really hard for a victim once they come out of that um, to trust anyone because the person they trusted the most is the person who exploited them. And so we as service providers, it makes it really difficult to begin to offer them help because, you know, why would they trust you? Why are you any different than the person mm -hmm. who I thought cared about me? And so um, it makes recovery really, really hard um, for those that come out of it because trust is a, is a real issue. 
So one of the biggest events in South Dakota is coming up, but it's also one of the biggest trafficking situations in the state of South Dakota. We've seen the numbers rise every year out at the rally. What can people look for as the rally approaches or as things are approaching to maybe there might be a situation where they've come across someone that's being trafficked? Yeah, I think I always see people have an inner to Inner, inner tuition, you know, right? Your, your inner voice is something in there is just isn't right. Um, but signs to look for is number one, if somebody is in a controlled situation, um, if they can't make eye contact, they don't have the ability to speak on their own behalf. You know, that could be another form of victimization, but it's also red flags for human trafficking. Um, if they have tattoos um, that are um, property of, or may have tattoos that look familiar from different gangs. Um, a lot of times traffickers will brand their, their product. Um, and so when they brand them, they basically use that as a fear tactic, an ownership tactic. Um, so sometimes tattoos um, are definitely a, a qualifier for potential uh, trafficking situations. And then individuals that don't have access to the ability to freely come and go. Um, when I say that, they may not have their identification, they may not have money, they may not have anything in their possessions, which means that that person is controlling all of those elements so that they cannot leave that situation successfully. And so if you identify um, that, we have posters that have gone through the state of South Dakota, but um, if you have not seen that and are not privy to that number, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is the Polaris line, mm -hmm. is one that actually um, is you can call in. That call is actually funneled to that state and is sent to the local law enforcement that have been trained to be able to identify human trafficking. And so I always say to community, this is not a call to freedom initiative. This is not an FBI or local law enforcement initiative. This is a community. And a community needs to come together and say no more to trafficking. And so when you have events like Sturgis, where large groups of people are coming into communities, you have the ability for organized crime on many different levels. Yeah. You see increase in drugs, you see the increase of human trafficking, you see the increase of domestic violence, um, you know, sexual exploitation. All of these things are prevalent, which leads into, you know, a vulnerabilities for trafficking. And so anytime um, the attorney generals, the feds and the Pennington County group have um, done sting operations for the last few years. And those sting operations are individuals who they um, go online, they pose as a 15, 14, 15 year old girl or boy wanting to sell themselves. Um, and people answer those ads every year. <laughs> every year they just think wow they they should know that we're doing this and and but that is addictions become very real for those what we call the demand or the buyer side and so what they do is then they answer those ads and these people were buying somebody under the age of 18 which is now in the state of south dakota and also on a federal level you do not have to prove force fraud or coercion if somebody is intending to sell somebody for sex under the age of 18. And so those are potential exploitation or trafficking situations. Um, and so with those dynamics last year, they did the sting operation and in the past, they've had people from Wisconsin, Minnesota, surrounding areas. This year, all 11 indictments were men um, from the state of South Dakota that were trying to purchase this young girl. And so that tells me that we have an issue here. And anytime we have demand, there's also the need for victims. And if we don't address that purchasing, that, um, you know, that, that sexual addiction side, um, and that demand is still there, we're going to have the need for more victims than we ever have. And so we have to address that whole picture of trafficking. Um, and with those dynamics, that just leads into large events, it, it being a real issue within different states. So let's talk a little bit more. Call to Freedom, as you said, is a nonprofit. You rely on a lot of donations, but you guys will have a huge fundraiser coming up here shortly with your annual breakfast. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and how people can get involved with that if they'd like to attend? Yeah, we um, October 14th. 
um, is our community breakfast. And I think we're, we're going to be making some announcements. I think we're going to be doing that virtually this year, um, just because of everything that's going on. Um, we want to make sure everybody's safe, but they have options. So we're going to be presenting three times that we'll be able to um, either host a party in your home to watch the community breakfast and support, or you can host within your businesses or host um, and just tune in yourself. Um, and what that is, is it's a one and only fundraiser throughout the year. And you can go to our Facebook page, which is called the Freedom South Dakota, um, or you can um, visit our website called the freedom.org under events and get signed up for that. And it's our one and um, we do fun two fundraisers now. One which is a hope, uh, hope night, um, which is just a small group of people and then the community breakfast. And that really helps us fund everything that we're trying to do throughout the year. Um, we do get state and federal funding for a lot of our staffing, um, but those other program development, um, outreach, counseling, medical needs, are brought in through dollars through our community members. And so we wouldn't be at the level that we're at and serving up to 70 active clients right now. And for some organizations, that doesn't sound like a lot. Um, but when we talk about people think that human trafficking is not happening here, and we're actively serving 70 clients and getting anywhere from four to six new referrals a week, um, that says that we have a problem. And um, as a problem, it means the more we talk about it, so thank you for this opportunity, Lee, and your team. Um, the more we talk about it, the more victims know that there is the ability to come out of that in a safe place. If they do not feel like they have somewhere safe to go, they will choose to stay in that environment. So um, these dollars are going back into continuing sustaining and developing our programs across the state of South Dakota to be able to serve more victims, identify more victims, and make sure that we have um, more support from you know, trainings to um, identification to services within the state of South Dakota. So again, that's called the freedom.org. Uh, October 14th is our commun fifth annual community breakfast. And so we would love to have you. If you wanna give into our organization, you can do that online. Um, feel free if you want a, a presentation or Zoom, make sure to connect with our community navigator and that's navigator at calldafreedom.org. She'll get, Wagner will get that set up and we would just love to um, be a part of any events that you feel like we could could um, bring awareness to, to anti-human trafficking, so. That's great. That is uh, Becky Rasmussen of Call to Freedom. We wanna thank her for joining us here on the people of Big Sioux Media as we got this beautiful day here, finally in South Dakota. It's not too hot. And um, thank you for your time, Becky. And good luck to Call to Freedom and out at the rally and bringing awareness to the rest of the state. Yeah, we really appreciate this uh, opportunity. And thank you for all those that are watching. And Lee, thank you for you and your team. We appreciate it. So again, this is Lee Palmer for Big Sioux Media. Enjoy the rest of your week. We will see you on our next episode of People of Big Sioux Media.